Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. The chairman of this occasion, Dr. Christopher Collardy, the celebrant, the author, Jim Ovia, and his wife, Kay Ovia, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the most economically successful in our midst owe society three taxes. And I must apologize for bringing up the uncomfortable subject of taxes in the company of business people. But the most successful in our midst owe us three taxes. The first is, of course, income taxes personal income and corporation taxes. And since both the Lagos and federal tax authorities are represented in their highest capacities here, I notice Mr. Tunde Fowler is here, it means either that the author is an excellent taxpayer or at least or at least that he has agreed to pay more immediately after this event. The second tax is a social tax, philanthropy, the obligation of the wealthy to give back to society. It was Andrew Carnegie, at one time America's richest man and the pioneer of mega philanthropy who said great fortunes are great blessings to a community. And I can testify that Gmovia is discharging that obligation, especially his investments in education, <laughs> the James Hope School, and in the training of thousands. I can testify also, personally, because he's the chair of the Northeast Children's Fund, a fund with which I'm associated, a fund for building comprehensive learning centers for thousands of orphans in the Northeast of Nigeria. The third tax is a civic tax, the obligation of the successful to write their stories, to share their experiences, and the histories of the phenomena that they have become in order to instruct to admonish and to inspire the present and the future. The task is a difficult one. If it is to be useful, the author must be prepared to be vulnerable because an honest and truthful account of the life of the truly successful may not necessarily be, as we've read from this book, from glory to glory. Indeed, the story may be more gory than glorious. I'm personally impressed, but not surprised, by Jim's great success in the discharge of this particular obligation. I'm not surprised that he tells the story honestly, because he is, despite great wealth and achievement, an exceedingly humble and self-effacing man. So I'm not surprised. So I'm not surprised that he's able to tell the story of the incredibly humble beginnings who, a man who lost his father at the age of five and with nothing whatsoever, with very little. In fact, he discusses all of the poverty. But more importantly, his admission that he did not even prevail because he was a superman or because he was a genius. His story, and if you read the story, left ample room for grace, for time and chance, and for sheer providence. The Nigerian dream is captured here a man from nowhere, uh, with apologies to all of those who are from Agbo here, including the royal father, from nowhere to a six trillion Naira enterprise. The vast majority of Nigeria's most successful entrepreneurs did not begin from families of great wealth or great education or great privilege. 
Most are, in fact, first-generation university degree holders. But they have cracked the ceilings imposed by poverty and deprivation. This is the true essence of the Nigerian dream. And he writes in the prologue, and I quote him, he says, the path to success is accessible to every young person, regardless of background, of family, or of income, or education. If I can do it, you can too, end of quote. But personal and business success stories abound here and there and everywhere. What is rare is the heart and commitment to build others, to nurture them, without the least apprehension that they could be better than himself. We heard of I. Gimokwede, the MD of a rival bank, and how Jim made a difference in his professional career and in the fortunes of his bank. And today we have three governors here, the Excellencies Kashim Shatima of Bono State, Emmanuel Odom of Cross River, Udom of Cross River State, Emmanuel Odom of Aqua Ibom State, beg your pardon, and Godwin Emefiele, the only one of them who has some cash. <laughs> the central bank, the central bank governor. These are leaders that Jim nurtured, has brought up, and has also helped to remain comfortable and well where they are. In Africa Rise and Shine, Jim uses his own story and many others to describe the trajectory of a continent and a nation that always appeared to be overcome by its challenges and contradictions. But like Jim's life story, the story of Africa and our nation will go well and will end well. We will renew ourselves. Jim's story gives us the key. At the end of the day, it's not about how much talent or how much potential. It's not about how the figures look in the first few days. It's about three things. One, character. Two, character. Three, character. <laughs> the integrity, the integrity of leadership, fidelity to a cause, despite all the distractions, the cause of self, the cause of service over self, service over self, sacrificial leadership. Neither a financial empire nor a nation can be built successfully if the leadership cannot delay gratification or if they cannot keep their hands off the capital or the commonwealth. It was Craig Longsborough who said, and I quote, one must give, one must give way to the other. Sacrifice of self or sacrifice for self. One must give way to the other. Sacrifice of self or sacrifice for self. The sacrifice of self for the greater good is the greatest calling imaginable. And it is the bedrock of the greatest nations and the greatest men and women. The sacrifice for self is the most pathetic calling imaginable and is the quicksand within which nations and men and women who would have been great perish. The Zenith story is a story of vision and hard work. It's a story of vision and hard work. But Jim lets us know that Zenith would involve that remaining Remaining at the zenith would involve a bit more. It would mean continuously, daily, serving the best interest of others. Congratulations, Jim. God bless you. <laughs>